Today's episode is episode 198 of Unconventional Humans Podcast. Today's episode is called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So today's episode is on some of the, I'm just going to share some of my thoughts around reading this book, what it brought up for me, and yeah, I'm just going to talk about it. So Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, it's an interesting title. There are two things that I wouldn't have put together so easily, but in reading this book, it makes sense. It makes sense to me anyway, because the author, Robert Piercig, the motorcycle maintenance part for me represented the analytical mind. So it's a mind that breaks down a farm, a farm in the form of motorcycle here breaks it down into its component parts its functions he he laid it out really well at one stage i could really resonate with it as a programmer where your job is to separate logic out and put it into functions functional pieces of code so you're breaking down a in this instance a motorcycle you're breaking it down into its component parts asking what function does each part do, what's its components. So I really appreciated that. And so this book for me explores the nature of thought. It's a very profound book, about 400 pages long. I looked a little bit into Robert Piercig afterwards because I got the impression that this was an extraordinary mind. I think this is really a work of genius, this book. And I got the sense from reading this book that the author must have struggled with their mental health because of the insights in this book. They couldn't have come from a mind that didn't struggle with mental health. At one stage, actually, he pointed to the original meaning of the word schizophrenia is when two so when two personalities two entities are struggling for the same body and that's a large part of this book you've got Phaedrus the ghost and you've got the main character who's living with Phaedrus. Phaedrus actually is the the main character. But he's his former self. So there's uh there's tension. So there's a huge amount of tension between the main character and Phaedrus. And actually as I'm describing this book, it's only beginning to dawn on me that I don't know what the main character's name because I don't think he gave him a name. And Phaedrus wasn't actually his former self, his real name either. It was Phaedrus was I think it was in reference to a like a Greek scholar, because he, he talks a lot about Greek thought, mythology. Talks a bit about mythos and logos. So mythos is the word for the mythology, the stories that shape humankind and in logos is more the logic and yeah so it just occurred to me i don't know what the name of the of the main character is but I, this book i think it was written as sort of a is autobiographical in nature but it's 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 kind of open to interpretation which I, I like that. I like when something's based on reality, but it's open to interpretation. So this book got me to think about a number of different things. The biggest thing, I guess, it gave me another perspective on the line you walk when you question the nature of thought and how that line verges towards insanity. That was... I feel like a large part of the tension between the narrator, the the main character in the book, and his former self was that his former self, the impression was that he had gone insane. And the main character today had learned a lesson from that and was trying to 
blend in a bit more with the people around him so he could be accepted socially. But deep down, Fade, both Phaedrus and his son, Chris, could sense that he wasn't being true to himself. And Chris, I think, was looking for the father he knew, who was no longer there. So that gets resolved towards the end of the book. But this book got me... It gave me another perspective into the reality that when you start questioning the nature of thought, when you start moving outside the, the mythos, the mythos in this respect will be in regard to the shared stories that people have in common. It's more at an unconscious level of the ways they act and behave and think in society. When you start moving outside that box, you're starting to move in a direction that is dangerous. It's more towards what society would deem as insanity. So so this book talks around that. So the main character, like he's hyper intellectual and he could see through the, the education system so he, he'll talk around like uh, he kind of shows like students that do well there's a big amount of it that's down to compliance and the students some of the some not all the students but some of the students that were doing badly at some deeper level they sense the charade that's going on and I guess they find the education system challenging because Phaedrus well, the main character he was interested in what he was doing for the sake of it. So he wasn't pursuing science or he wasn't pursuing philosophy for a career. It was because he had an innate, innate interest in it, in pursuing it. And the main character here is Phaedrus. He was a man on a mission, a man on a mission to undo some of the unconscious thinking in society from the past. It was a heavy burden on his shoulders and you got a sense of, or I got a sense of a man with a lot of pressure. You could see through a lot of things and he also had this ultimate dilemma of staying true to himself even though that was on the path where he's playing with insanity or conforming and knowing deep down that he's a shadow of who he could be. The thing with the Phaedrus character was that he was antagonistic. His ultimate goal was to seek out truth. And he didn't care whether people liked him or not. And I think that's what Chris, his son, liked about that character. So... I'll just bring it back to to my own life, like why I feel this is relevant for me, this is why I found this book interesting. I've had mental health struggles and a good portion of it is down to this conflict of I know when something's off and I know I've got the mind capable of understanding what's off, but I also know that the more I see of what's off, the more I'm playing with that line of insanity. And uh, that's it's an unnerving place to be. But I also take heart from this book that I think the character, the main character, he reconciled himself with the past, with Phaedrus. And he... Like the ending is open to interpretation, but actually I think there's actually a prologue at the start which clarifies things. And I got the sense that the reconciliation, the choice he chose was to be true to himself. And so that for me is heartening that you can learn the lessons from your past, your past mental health struggles, and not have to 
live in insanity, but also not have to live in a world where you feel like a shell of yourself, that there's a middle ground there where you can be true to yourself and let the chips fall where they may in the future. That's what I found heartening from this. And that's what I appreciated from this book. Like the detail to this book was unbelievable for me that that's why I sensed that this was a guy who had gone through things that were difficult in his life, mental health wise. I think that's, that's part of it. Like if you're going to question the nature of thought, if you're going to question your mind, it's dangerous territory. But then I think it's also dangerous if you've got that proclivity, if you're that way inclined, if you're wired that way, I think you'll also struggle with mental health problems because I know in the first part of my life, I guess, when I was a bit younger, I wasn't so much inclined to pursue intellectually what I pursue now. And I felt that I also struggled for that. I felt numb to myself. And at a deeper level, things weren't sitting well with me the way I was the way I was behaving. Yeah, just things didn't feel that real to me. So, yeah, this, this book kind of shows to me that the path this guy went on is not an easy path, not for everyone. But It's possible to pursue this path nonetheless. The thing I got from this book was that this guy is very interesting. The way he describes things, the way he sees things. And I just found it was a pity that some of the people he was with weren't receptive to it or they were afraid of his insight. That they were afraid to to listen to what he would say, the more the profound stuff he would say. I found that a pity but I also understand that because it plays into that when you start questioning this stuff you are starting to you you are moving towards the possibility of thinking in an irrational being seen to be thinking in an irrational manner to the rest of society because this is what this book talks about. What's rationality based on? What is rationality? He has a word for quality. He talks a bit in this book. This was his word for... What I got from it, this was his word for direct perception of reality. It's it's the word for what's there before concepts exist. So he, you've mind matter and need quality in between. So... His thing with quality was like that determines the the I think that determines the perceptual experience when subject meets object. So it's a mind fuck, this whole thing when you're thinking about this, but because it's a mind fuck doesn't mean that there isn't some insights to gain here. Because the problem with his thing with quality was that he's setting something up that he's saying is undefinable. But in saying that, that's analytical thought saying that. That's the that's the dynamic you're playing with here. You're trying to describe something that's unquantifiable. And you'd wonder what what's the point of that? That's kind of what I'd be questioning sometimes. What's the point in trying to describe something that you're saying is undefinable? And the problem is that we don't see beyond the things that we can define. Personally, I think it is important because the importance comes from just the acknowledgement that there's something more powerful and more profound than our definitions of the world. I think it's just the acknowledgement. Because when you are in, like described in this book, the church of reason, that can become cult-like 
where all you see is logic. Everything comes down to evidence-based, facts-based, and there's a place for that. I think that's why this book is called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, because for me, the Zen part is the powerful, undefinable part that precedes the conceptual part, the maintenance part. And if you don't have the Zen part, for example, here, and you just have the motorcycle maintenance part, the analytical part, then then you're not living in reality. You're just living in your conceptual mind. I think that's the, the danger of not acknowledging that there's something that precedes it. That's what I get from my own explorations on things. And that's what I was getting from this book was Phaedrus had a chip in his shoulder because the church of reason can become like anything. It can become dogmatic. And I guess it ties into our need for known as human beings. It's very hard for us to sit with the unknown. I know that in my own life, I find it very uncomfortable to sit with an unknown future. It's difficult, it's ambiguous. But I think it does us more damage, it does me more damage when I can't sit with the unknown, when I can't acknowledge the unknown. So that's something that I'm gonna try and carry more into my life again. It's one of those things where you keep learning the same lessons over and over and over again. Just hopefully they get more ingrained at each, t at each level. And there was another word in this book, Mew. I think it's a Japanese term for unasked the question. So he was talking about it in terms of with scientific experiments, an experiment is usually set up around the premise that you're gonna get yes or no, you're gonna get some sort of answer to this here. He also talked about this book, the, when you're doing experiments, you've got hypothesis is he was saying that they actually they're unending they're never ending because once you've got one hypothesis and you've got an experiment set up it will just lead into more and more hypotheses and it, it actually never ends so I guess one of the big things I took from this book is that there's never just two choices and that's kind of our problem with the analytical mind and the information and it's even manifest in our technology. If you boil it down to what the technology is made up of, it's a series of ones and zeros. That's binary code. That's at the deepest level. That's low level. That's the lowest level of, of languages you're going to get. It's a, it's the binary code. The one and zero, yes or no, off or on. And Phaedrus is saying in this book that there's a third option. And in English, we don't even have a word for it. But in Japanese, they do, which is mu, M-U. And it's unasked a question. And that's the option you get when you ask a question that the answer is too profound for the question to contain it. So you have to unask the question. It's an example of it he gave in a book was, it's like a Zen koan. It's like, do dogs have a Buddha nature? That's the question. And any answer you give is going to fall short of a suitable answer. So that's when you unask the question. So you can apply that to your life. That's what I'm applying to my life. That gives me hope when there's not a clear way forward, when I don't know what I'm doing, when I don't see where the end goal is here. I can see that because I'm not getting a yes or no answer here. I'm not getting a clear way forward. The next option then, the third option I can do here is unask, figure out what the question I'm asking is, which is focusing me in a certain direction, and unask the question. Stop asking that question. Leave space in my mind to ask a new question, to see something different. So that's something that I think I've been using for a while. Sometimes I forget it, but it's good to, to know that there's a third option there that can potentially help you could come unstuck. I think they're the main things I wanted to cover today. There's a lot of stuff in this book. I think it's definitely worth a read. He's written a second book. There's another book as well he mentioned. 
probably read that at some stage. Not straight away, though. It's, it's one of those books there's a lot to take in. Really f- glad I found it. It actually, I think it was a bestseller at the time. I think he wrote it in the 70s. And well worth a read. Check it out. So that's it today. <laughs>